iteration is perfection. It's the iterative process that's perfect. It's not being perfect. It's the iterative process that's perfect. It's making micro iterations constantly, never endingly. Okay, so today's talk is called Disruptive Innovation and How to Change the Game Fearlessly. And let's talk about that word fearlessness first because you really can't disrupt anything in your life, anything in business, anything in the world unless you get your body into the space of fearlessness. And so to me, fearlessness isn't the absence of fear. Fearlessness is taking action in the face of fear. And how do you do that? Like, what's the way to get into the space of fearlessness before you're about to jump off the bridge and get after something that might be uncomfortable for you, for the world, for society? I learned about this part of your body called the Dantian. I'd love to invite everyone to take their index finger, the middle finger, lift it up, yes, and put it right here, right below your belly button. And this is your dantian, this is your power center. The Chinese scriptures talk about this area of your body where this is where everything began. This is where your authentic power lies. And when you think about when you were born, this is the umbilical cord that fed you, we weren't born thinking that, you know, about fear. We were not fearful of anything. That, that's a learned behavior in a lot of ways. And so every time I'm about to step into something that is challenging, that's weird, that's going against society, I always take my two fingers and take three long deep breaths and tap into my dantian. So I hope you guys do that too. Also, a thing that I, I really took to heart is that I figured out that from the point you graduate college to the point you die, we only have 21,000 days to live. And that's it. That's it, 21,000 days. So what are we gonna do with that time? Are we gonna spend it whiling away, you know, just on our phones? Are we gonna spend our time just talking shit about others? Are we gonna spend that time really disrupting our lives, disrupting something in the world and getting in full authentic alignment within ourselves? So let's just get into it. So what is disruptive innovation? Disruptive innovation is simply an innovation that creates a new market which eventually overtakes an existing market an innovation that creates a new market which eventually overtakes an existing market. Let's give you some examples. The Model T car was a disruptive innovation. And how? Well, before there used to be the horse and buggy sort of category, right? Before, the, so, so when cars existed only for the really, really wealthy people. And only, so, so not, it couldn't become a disruptive innovation until the Model T came to be. And the Model T was affordable to the masses. Ford created this amazing looking car too. And this, because it was affordable to the masses and was functional and it totally disrupted the horse and buggy category. Let's keep going. The internet microprocessor disrupted the way information was being transmitted across the world. Credit card PayPal disrupted the way money was exchanged. Anesthesia, I'm bouncing from eras of generations, but anesthesia disrupted the way operations were had. I had three ACL reconstructions. I played soccer professionally for a couple of seasons. I played for 30 years. And without that important anesthesia, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't be doing this right now. Um, and also I had, I had, uh, I also had a C-section, like a C-section, like how do you do, how do you show a C-section without it being really scary? I mean, I actually witnessed my twin sister giving birth a couple of months and I was like the person behind the camera, like Nat Geo style, you know, filming the C-section. And when, you, like, if you've actually seen what a C-section is, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, so, and without that important anesthesia, that disruptive innovation, it would be a really, really hard thing to do. Um, let's fast forward to disrupting consumer products. In the consumer product space, your companies like Tom Shoes and Warby Parker completely disrupted the idea of one for one, and introduced the idea of a one for one model. You guys all have heard of that. Um, and we'll talk about how we've sort of elevated the buy one, give one model into something a little bit more learned from the experience. Um, Dollar Shave Club totally disrupted the subscription model. When you think about why did Unilever buy Dollar Shave Club for a billion dollars? They bought Dollar Shave Club for a billion dollars because what took uh, Gillette 100 years to do 
took Dollar Shave Club three from a, from a customer acquisition perspective, from sort of a scaling exponentially in the same way that, that took Gillette 100 years. And so they disrupted the subscription model. Now everybody, everything in their mother has a subscription model about something or other. Um, Uber, Airbnb disrupted the way taxis and hotels, you know, that industry. And when you think about these categories, specifically these, I think a lot about um, sort of the, the tax companies are lobbying, you know, their cities really hard, or the hotels that are lobbying their cities hard to not bring these innovations in, to not have this happen. And whenever I think about that, I think about this statistic that 88% of Fortune 500 companies in 1955 are now gone because they did not iterate fast enough. And so people who are trying really hard to like stay just that this is the way it is, when you think about blockbuster video, like yes, CDs like on you know, mail order ain't gonna work, hashtag Netflix. Um, or you think about you know, all these, my, 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 my beloved Blackberry, God bless, God rest your soul. I was like, I just still can't do the thing anymore. My fingers are just not, I like the buttons, anyway. So yeah, the, the, um, you really need to iterate. You know, one of my favorite sayings that all my teams know is iteration is perfection. It's the iterative process that's perfect. It's not being perfect, it's the iterative process that's perfect. It's making micro iterations constantly, never endingly. That's what creates perfection. Um, so while all these sort of companies are disrupting these other categories, I chose to focus my time and attention on the taboo space, namely the business of peas. I actually discovered that all of my businesses start with the letter P, and when I figured this out, I was like, oh my God, who can I call? This is unbelievable. Like, they all start with letter P. I think I'm, like, it's my destiny. Um, so pizza, periods, P, and poop, what? Can you believe it? It's crazy, I couldn't believe it. And then of course the fifth P, which is parenting. And you know, to me it's the hardest startup of them all, I gotta tell you, My little hero, Happy, that's his name. H-I-R-O, Japanese, I'm half Japanese. Um, so let's go through them. So the pizza category, like why, like why was I interested in this category? Well, I discovered, so, I, so a, a quick backstory, I spent um, after I graduated from Cornell University, I worked in investment banking for, you know, a couple of years, the analyst program. I, I worked at Deutsche Bank, I mean Deutsche Bank, um, <laughs> and I uh, hope they're not a sponsor. Uh, just kidding. Uh, and 9-11 and happened, and, um, and my subway stop every single morning was to World Trade Center. And um, usually what I would do is get off the train at Two World Trade, get tea with my girlfriend who worked on the 100th floor at Aon at Two World Trade Center and then walk across the street to my office. And 9-11 happened and it was um, the craziest thing. 700 people in my girlfriend's office died that day. Two people in my office died on that day. And it was the only day in my life that I slept through my alarm clock. Never before, never after, to this day, have I ever slept through my alarm clock. And so it was a universe saying like, all right, you know, like you gotta get after it. I realized that the mystery of life is that you never know when it's gonna end. And the time was absolutely in that moment to make it count, and I was 22 years old, and I was like, all right, like, thank God I wasn't 32, 42, 52 before I had that wake up call. We all have these aha moments that sort of shake us awake to be like, I gotta fulfill my destiny or it's gonna be too late. The 21,000 days kicked in very, very quickly for me. And, um, and so I wrote down three things I wanna do with my life. The first was to make movies, the second was, just to, was to play the first was to play soccer professionally, the second was to make movies, and the third was to start a business. And so play, I tried out for the New York Magic, made the team, had the ACLs, hung up my cleats, that was over. And then I worked in the film business. And while in the film business, I, in the film business, I learned so much about sort of project management, and this was when I had my first aha moment for my first business. And it was born out of a stomach ache. And we all know the saying, necessity is the mother of invention. And um, I had realized that a while on sets of commercials and music videos, I would eat off the craft service tables. Craft service tables are these little tables that offer free food, and my favorite price was free, it, hashtag immigrant. And, um, and I would just be eating all this like pigs in the blanket and all these crappy, like M all just crappy food, but it was free, so I was like, I have student loans, like this is great. And I would just eat that, I would come home and just have awful stomach aches every single night. 
and especially when I ate pizza. I would just come home bloated, farty, gassy. I'm like, nobody come near me, this is bad. <laughs> and finally, I was like, enough is enough, and I went to Auntie Google, and I was like, what's happening? And I discovered the massive processed food industry. I discovered that you know, there was pesticides and preservatives and antibiotics and hormones and all these things in food that was making people really intolerant to food today. And I discovered that 20% of Americans eat, now eat gluten-free. Everyone has a micro-intolerance to, ma to major intolerances to gluten. And I was like, all right, here's an opportunity to create New York City's first alternative pizza concept, gluten-free flours, hormone-free cheeses, local seasonal toppings, and disrupt this $32 billion category. I don't know if you guys know that Americans eat 100 acres of pizza every single day. We love pizza, got it. Hashtag opportunity. Um, and so I created Slice, now called Wild, and we opened our first location in the Upper East Side of New York City, then opened the next one in the West Village, and then opened one in Williamsburg and Park Slope in this magical urban greenhouse. And I've since opened a couple in, um, in Guatemala, of all places. <laughs> we had a couple, of a couple of groups who wanted to like, open up. They're like, sin gluten is going to be huge in Central America. And we're like, yes, pay me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> great, great. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned working in the restaurant business very, very quickly, well, it wasn't that quickly, actually, because it took me seven years working the restaurants, getting like pizza oven burns. My, by the way, never worked in a restaurant day in my life before, never even cooked anything before I opened my restaurant. I'm like, how hard could this be? I would have like oven burns on my arms, like for seven straight years, I'd open the pizza oven like an amateur hour, would open my arm, and I would just be like, ah, you know, it's one of those. And finally, I brought in seven years later a partner, an operator, a restaurateur, someone who knew what he was doing. And literally within one week of him taking over the restaurant operations, our numbers doubled. After seven years, you guys. And then within one month, our numbers tripled. And I was like, but where do I put the gun? I'm like, where do I, I can't believe this, it's crazy. And so that was such a huge lesson for me early on, was that I needed to focus on what I do best and let the others focus on what they do best and we can be in mutual awe of each other. And Waleed and I are in mutual awe of each other, my partner, and it was so funny because up until finding Waleed, I did have managers who like stole from me and who got just, I mean, you name it, I had like every painful like, experience in my life happen for me, for me, get down to me, before me, got it, got it, got it, yes. Um, I'm like telling myself over and over again, for me, it happened for me. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I finally, when I met Walid, who's my, I met him through Moby years, years prior, and finally I was like, you know, thinking about getting, bringing a partner on, my first question to him was like, do you believe in karma? And he was like, Mickey, every time I have a bad thought, a bicycle run over my foot. <laughs> and I was like, are you the genie from Aladdin? You're hired! <laughs> it was amazing, it was a moment, and he's been such an incredible partner, and he really believes in karma, it's for real. And I was so, I'm so grateful to him to this day. So with Walid in place, it really freed up my time to focus on my next invention, which was also born out of necessity. So I was one of those people, that I would like ride my bicycle from one restaurant to another, on my period and forget to change my tampon or pad. And I would just be like, oh my God. It was like one of those like moments of like getting my period for the first time every single month. It was like, <laughs> what is happening? Am I dying? Like, this is insane. What's going on? And I just like would be that person like hugging walls all the time, doing like the karaoke. I would be that person. It would just, it would be like, a non-stop shit show, okay? <laughs> and so I finally was like, okay, what the fuck? Like, what is happening this, in this category? And I looked it up and discovered that there had only been three major innovations in the entire 20th century. Tampons, pads, and menstrual cups. And by the way, most were invented by men. And, um, and I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Three innovations in the entire 20th century in a thing, in a category where women do every single month, no matter what. Like, this is nuts. And so finally, we were like, all right, enough is enough. We're going to create the... Uh, so, so the story is, is that my twin sister and I were defending our three-legged race championship title at my family barbecue called Agripalooza. 
Our last name's Agrawal, Agrawal. Agrawal. Dad's like, Agra, Palooza. <laughs> and uh, my twin sister and I were defending our three-legged race championship title, and we were tied to each other. And in the middle of the race, tied to each other, my sister started her period. And like, literally like, bled into my sock. <laughs> As we're like, and then like we of course won because we're super competitive. And then like went and like climbed and like ran up the stairs, still tied to each other, into the bathroom. And then she took her bathing suit bottoms out and started washing them out. And as she was washing out the blood from her bathing suit bottoms was when the idea hit. Wouldn't it be amazing to create a pair of underwear that never leaked, that never stained, that supported women every day of the month during super important times like the three-legged race? And, uh, and, and I remember walking outside and talking to my older sister, Yuri, who's a head and neck surgeon, you know, Harvard, blah, 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 Asian parent dream person. And, uh, and uh, it's like they have on the card, they have like the Harvard sticker and the like Yale Medical School and like our Cornell sticker on the side because Cornell's like, you know, the JV of the Ivy Leagues. And they're like, Neh. it's like on the tire, you know? Not that I'm bitter about it or anything, can you tell? Um, no, so, so we asked her, we're like, Yuri, like why is it that every single one of your pairs of underwear have like a stain in them? Because like she's, she's gonna hate me right now, but it's true, <laughs> it, they all do. And, uh, and I was like, why? And she was like, because when you're literally operating on someone's face, you can't be like, yo face, just stay open, I'll be right back, I'm gonna change my tampon, okay, you cool? <laughs> like you just can't do that, you can't. And then I just started thinking about the time, every time I played soccer, like at the highest level, I can't be like, yo ref, can you just, Time out, I'm just gonna change my tampon, BRB. Like, you just can't do that. You can't do that, like, stuck in traffic, about to make out with your boyfriend. Like, any situation, <laughs> like, you can't just be like, time out, you know, it just doesn't work. And so you have to keep going. And what do we need? Well, we need an alternative to do that. And so we spent the next, my twin sister, myself, and our third co-founder spent the next, you know, three and a half, almost four years developing the sort of most like a, a technical underwear that looks and feels like a regular pair of underwear but has built-in technology that makes them leak-proof and absorbent and antimicrobial and moisture-wicking. And you literally feel sexy. Like the, my litmus test for sexiness is like the last couple of years at Burning Man, I would go and everyone's like in their most scantily clad like outfits, you know? People would be wearing their Thinks underwear, would come running up to me being like, And I'm like, you look sexy, girlfriend. Mm, yeah, she's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, the, the fact that they're like, they're, they're being worn as like their sexiest outfits, I'm like, all right, that's a, that's a score right there. Um, so, so yeah, so once we built this, one of the things that we realized was that we needed to really, in the very beginning of the business, we wanted to weave in a give back mission because we truly believe that the, that the future of entrepreneurship is social entrepreneurship. It cannot be otherwise. Like I sit in the board of conscious capitalism and we also understand that conscious businesses outperform like the major indices by up to 14X. So actually, if you're thinking about every stakeholder, if every stakeholder wins, your business actually succeeds more. And so beyond that, for us, like I knew that if I'm gonna get into the underwear business I know nothing about, I know that during the times that are the most painful, the hardest, the most like frustrating when you're dealing with like website issues or manufacturing issues or personnel issues or whatever issue, I get to close my eyes and really tap back in to the give back mission, like the why we're doing it. Yes, I wanna support myself, but I also wanna support those who really need these kinds of products. And so we started thinking about the Tom Shoes model. I talked about that for a second before, about the one for one model and the buy one, give one model. And there's, a, there, there's an inherent flaw with the model. I'm also one of those people who do not, who always like hates it when people are like, ugh, can you believe they tried to do that model and they totally like, fuck things up? And just like, no, 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 you have to start somewhere, learn, and build and grow from it. People just love to write shitty, mean headlines and talk shit about people who are in the arena. And so I really commend Tom's, I really commend them for creating the starting point of what was something to be built upon. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what, what we learned from the Tom's model is that if I, what's your name? Susan. Susan, I love your shawl. Um, so Susan is working in Uganda and she's selling shoes in the beating sun. She's a local Ugandan woman who's just selling, who's doing her best to make a living selling shoes in the beating sun. All of a sudden an influx of free shoes arrive in your neighborhood. What happens to Susan's business? 
it struggles, right? It might go out of business, it might fail. And so actually when you're doing what you think you're doing, which is giving, when you think you're giving, what you're actually creating is a welfare model. It's actually not an empowerment model. And so rather than hurting Susan's business, I, we chose to give money to Susan to grow her business. And so what, we're did, what we did is we looked for one of the, one of the best um, menstrual pad creators in all of Africa and found this company called AfriPads based in Uganda and Kampala. And they make washable, reusable cloth pads at an affordable price. And they're a for-profit company. And they hire all local women, create lots of local jobs. And at the time when we met them, they had about 25 employees. And what we said to them was like, look, for every pair of underwear that we sell in America, we would love to fund your company, give you the money to basically create more pads, subs lower the cost of your, your pad at, for the end user, and create this empowerment model. And in a couple of short years, they went from 25 employees to over 200 employees. And, you know, and it really, and it shifted so much for all the local women in the, in the area. So that, that empowerment model worked, and we're so, so excited to keep seeing that through. Let's go to the second P, P. <laughs> um, so, so while we were building things, people kept reaching out to us saying, hey, can this be used for light bladder leakage? And we looked into it again and discovered that the urinary incontinence mark, the light bladder le leakage category, is a $7 billion category. And there have only been things like Depends and Poise and these diaper-like products where women feel, and men, feel so unsexy and un just, they just feel so not themselves. All of a sudden, you, you, you grow out of your diapers when you're like two, and then you're back in them when you're, you know, after you've had like pushed a gigantic baby out of your vagina, like that's not cool, right? And so we wanted to create a product that was beautiful, that was sexy, that made women feel iconic. And, um, and it was completely separate technology, but had similar, an, a similar idea to things, period underwear, but it was really about absorbing urine faster. You know, the odor thing was an issue, making sure that it leaked, did not leak through at all. There was a lot of different considerations. The consistency of period blood to urine are very, very different. But the most important thing was you had to look and feel really, really amazing, like you're wearing just a regular pair of underwear. And so we spent the next couple of years really perfecting our pee-proof underwear product called Icon. And um, one of the things that we also really, really cared about was we learned about the obstetric, obstetric fistula problem that was starting to you know, become a real problem throughout Africa and even um, in Asia. And does, do people know what obstetric fistula is? Okay, if not, here we go. Obstetric fistula is it. So when a woman gives birth, so my older sister, Yuri, when she gave birth to Emmy, a gigantic baby, she ripped a hole in her bladder canal. And so when you rip a hole in the bladder canal, you, you can either, in the first world, you just sew it back up and you're back in business in a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe in a month. In the developing world, if you push a baby out of your vagina and you rip a hole in your bladder canal, you end up literally peeing yourself for the rest of your life. And imagine waking up every morning, you just soaked your, your sheets, you soaked your mattresses, you soak everywhere you walk, you're peeing, you smell. And so these women who, give, who did nothing but give birth are sequestered to these fistula camps to die. Like they're, they're called the modern day lepers. And they just gave birth. And so we were just so just couldn't believe when we learned about what, what this was, and we reached out to the Fistula Foundation and said, for every pair of Icon underwear sold that supports women in the first world to you know, have a little bit of, when you sneeze or cough or jog or jump, you pee a little bit, and we support you here, we fund fistula operations. And today we've helped hundreds and hundreds of women get back in their lives and rejoin their families and their communities, and we're so excited about that. Ah, poop. <laughs> the final frontier. Um, yes, 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 poop. Guys, if you actually think about what we're doing right now, like the way we wipe ourselves has not changed since the late 1800s. You think about like I'm on this like microphone thing, we have like our iPhones, and we've got like Wi-Fi and technology, and then like the minute we jump into our bathrooms, poof, we're back into the 1800s. <laughs> Literally, that's what's happening. 
And it's, it's crazy when you actually ask yourself, like, what you're doing. So, like, so here's a couple of analogies. Like, would you imagine if you just jumped in your shower and didn't turn the water on and just used dry paper and you're like, yeah, 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 I'm clean, I'm good. Right? Like, people would be like, that person's a little woohoo, <laughs> you know? Or imagine if you went to your dirty dish sink and you're like, cut, off, like, cut open a raw chicken salmonella all over it, yeah. And, and basically, instead of using water to like wash your dish, you're using like dry toilet paper and you're like, yeah. And then you put your dish away. People will be like, never eating here again, that's not, you know? It's like people, like if a bird pooped on your head, would you take a piece of dry paper and smear the poop all over your head or would you wash it off with water? It's like, you know, people, we've just, I mean, indoctrination is so powerful, indoctrination runs so deep, I mean, generationally deep, that we don't question so many things in our lives. And when we do question it, when you're like, wait a minute, like, why am I doing it this way when no wonder I have itchy butt 24-7, you know? And by the way, wet wipes cause anal fissures, because when you're actually, like, using wet wipes over and over again, it strips away the natural oils from her behind, creating like, like anal itching and anal fissures. I'm just letting you know <laughs> that just giving you the information and you can do what you want with it. Um, also, what's so crazy is, I don't know if you guys know that 15 million trees are getting flushed down the toilet every single year just for toilet paper consumption. 15 million trees, I mean, the Canadian boreal forest is being decimated and being flushed down the toilet. It's the Amazon of North America, and it's being cut down to do what? Something that doesn't even properly do its job, doesn't even clean us properly, and yet we're just doing it unconsciously because we've just been doing it forever. And so it was something that was so important, half Japanese, half Indian, both cultures grew up with bidets. And we've always been shamed by our Asian parents. They're always like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> I thought we were first, third world. <laughs> and we're like, okay, okay. So we created Tushy with a tagline for people who poop. <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> That's what we all do. And what it is is simply a modern bidet that clips onto your existing toilet and turns any toilet into a bidet in 10 minutes. There's no plumbing, no electrical required. It's only $69, so like anybody can afford it. When you think about the Model T car and how it disrupted the horse and buggy category, it was because it was affordable to the mass. It was something that was cool looking. It was something that people felt like an like a, like a aspirational thing was now part of their lives. It's a very similar experience. Like we wanted to create something that was beautiful, that looked aspirational. Like we have so many people who send us messages being like, I threw a tushy party and I, want, I installed it. I want to have everyone come and look at my bathroom. And we're like, yes, this is amazing. And so that's, that's the kind of stuff that we've been kind of thinking about. Like what is it, how can we change culture? How can we shift culture in a way that makes it fun, that makes it uplifting? We're gonna get into that right now. So, but just to quickly go over how it works, because people are always like, how does Tushy work? You take the toilet seat off, you drop the Tushy on there, you put the toilet seat back on, you connect it to the clean water behind your toilet, it does not pull the water from your tank or your bowl, it's not dirty toilet water, and it just takes 10 minutes and you're done. So that's it, there you have it, you're welcome. That's all I gotta say. Um, and for every Tushy bidet sold, we are helping fight the global sanitation crisis. I don't know if you guys know that right now, over three billion people don't have a safe place to go to the bathroom every single day. You know, almost a billion people are practicing open defecation, which is where they have to poop outside in the corner. And women, women especially, women and girls, are at risk of getting raped, at risk of getting pillaged, of getting hurt by, by just the local boys who just don't know any better. And so oftentimes women and girls do not drink enough water do, or fluids, do not eat enough food, because they don't want to go during the day, in broad daylight, and they often, millions of women wait till nightfall, go in packs of women, walking miles away just to relieve themselves. This is the reality of millions and millions of women today. And so like we really, really, you know, it, it's fun and, and, and cute talking about periods, pee and poop, you know, in that way, but it's also, the most serious, like life-changing daily struggles for, for millions of people around the world. And so what we've done is we partnered up with an organization called Samagra that, make, um, that, that build clean sanitation facilities. And rather than just putting up a sanitation, you know, like a toilet and then leaving, because a lot of early, early on, a lot of um, 
sanitation companies did that. They would just, or, or these nonprofits would come in, they would build these latrines, and they would leave. And the communities who've been, def, who've been pooping outside their whole lives are like, what is this thing? They poop in there, and then they all of a sudden become the cesspool of more infection. And so what, why we partner up with Samagra is because they're, they're an amazing organization who learned from that. They can't just go and build something and leave. They have to go there and teach the community why they need it. Teach the community that, hey, guess what? In six months' time, if you use this, you'll see lots of changes. And, and, and in the meantime, between now and then, while you're skeptical, every time you use this bathroom, we'll give you a free bar of soap. We'll give you a couple of like, you know, minutes on your phone. We'll give you this, that, and the other. People are like, oh, okay, I'll try it, I guess just for those extra things. And then all of a sudden, the place smells, their community smells less. All of a sudden, their kids are getting less sick. All of a sudden, they're getting less sick. All of a sudden, their water is cleaner. All of a sudden, they feel better as a community. They feel more... Oh, I can breathe without just breathing in stench all day long. And they realize in six months that this is really, really valuable. And so Samagra also teaches these people how to clean the toilets, hires some of the locals from each community to go and, and give them jobs to clean them properly. And then, and then, and then after six months, Samagra releases the training wheels and says, okay, families, now you understand the benefits of this thing. Each family have to pay $1.25 per family per month per family per month. Most of these people make between $2 and $3 per day. So using a clean sanitation facility, $1.25 per family per month, is totally doable to hire two people to keep the thing clean. And it's working, and then, you can, and it, and then it's, it's, again, you teach a man to fish, and then you leave and go to the next community, go to the next community, go to the next community. It's not a welfare model for life, it's an empowerment model, and that's why we chose to partner with them. We're so proud to be their partner. Um, and to date, we've helped over 50,000 families gain access to clean sanitation. I'm very proud of that. Oh, I must remind you, <laughs> do not go to tushy.com. It is a very graphic porn site. <laughs> anal porn site, no less. We're like, should we do a partnership with them? No, 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 we can't, we can't. Um, go to hellotushy.com. We've had investors, we're like, no, you know? And like, it's been so like, and it's just so graphic. You're like, oh God, please. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's get into this. How do you creatively introduce a disruptive concept to market? How do we do that? How do you shift culture? How do you take a company or an idea from nothing and build it to $150 million, having raised only $1.5 million? How do you do it profitably in this market where the Facebook algorithm is all fucked? You know, like, how do you do that? I'm going to open up sort of the, pull back the curtain on how to do that. I think oftentimes in conferences, people talk in sort of like high-level platitudes sometimes, and I think... You know, for me, like what I gain the most is when I really get into the weeds of like, how did you do it? Like what ad worked? Like what worked? Like what were the images that worked? And we're just gonna get into that really quickly so we can explain and share with you what worked for us. Um, so a simple thing, the first thing is edutainment. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that we know that when you put out a video that's funny but also educational, it really works. It doesn't have to cost a lot. This next video I'm about to show you costs us $20,000 and it's an evergreen video that we made two and a half years ago. It's still returning, it's returned over a million dollars and it's, you know, it costs us $20,000 to make. You might not know it, but wiping your bum with toilet paper after you poop is ineffective. Take it from somebody that walks around with their nose at butt level all day. <sighs> toilet paper just smears around your residue doo instead of washing it away. Especially if you're furry down there. Meet Tushy. Tushy is a bidet attachment that easily clips onto your toilet and sprays your hiney super clean and shiny. It's like a car wash, but for butts. So many other countries with people that poop use these things, except for us. It's time to get with the poop program, people. <laughs> It sprays your only spot with a concentrated stream of H2O. It's super pooper easy to install, and it even comes with a 60-day risk-free guarantee. Once your backside goes bidet, you can never go back. For $69, this little doohickey is a butt cheek no-brainer. <laughs> Yay. That kid is so adorbs. Oh my god, we love him. Um, gifts. People don't understand, like, this simple gift that we put, put on our website in the second div literally increase our conversion rate by 20%. This, simple, it costs us zero dollars. Take the seat off, put the tushy on there, showing it how it works, put the seat back on, and then, 
and then you spray your butt. And that's it. Just showing the simple doom, 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 showing how it works, increase the conversion rate by 20%. We really can't, like, you know, every time we put a GIF somewhere on our website in a strategic way, our conversion rate skyrockets. It can't be everywhere because then it'll slow down your website um, speed, but putting the basic how-tos in a GIF format is something that really we, show, we, we saw converts. Also, we just made these little lifestyle GIFs that also work, also evergreen. These are two, two of my best friends. We're like, nice kimono, dude. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I got nice legs. Okay. <laughs> um, so just something like this. There's a little lifestyle as a GIF. People just love this shit. It's crazy as it converts, like evergreen. Um, strong value props deliver in a fun way. These videos, we did like five of these for $2,500. We just hired like a local artist that just graduated from school and we just had her do these things and 2,500 bucks, evergreen videos, returns to this day, has made us hundreds of thousands of dollars on 2,500 bucks. <laughs>it's just so simple but like again people just resonate with these kinds of videos they're very meme on on, Insta on Instagram especially when you have like the bottom or top bar with text in it and an image people just like it's so basic but that shit works um, artful and fridge worthy my team I'm always challenging my teams for for all of my brands to um, to come up with designs and creative that, it, that are artful and fridge-worthy. What I mean by fridge-worthy is, you know when you walk home into your house, you open your door after a long day, and you, you go into your, you, right, you get to your fridge, and on your fridge, there's like pictures of your family members, invitations to weddings, like, you know, these little emblems of your life, like photographs of your loved ones, all these things. And my challenge to my teams is, could we make something, a piece of advertising, so beautiful and so artful and so personal that it can make the small real estate on your fridge. I mean, that's a challenge. Like, what can you make that can tug on the heartstrings and feel so authentically, like, you know, personal that it can make the small real estate in your fridge? And so we made for our, our Subway campaign, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a second, but here are some of the fridge-worthy ads um, that we created that are on people, that were like on people's fridges. We sent these out and it was just an amazing, amazing show of like, yes, we created something that was fridge worthy. Um, accessible, relatable language, another key, key thing when you're introducing something different or unique or something sometimes confusing, when, when you can't be like, so what do you do? And you can't really say it in one sentence to really talk about what you're doing, you should be able to say it in one sentence, but if you can't, talking about it in an accessible, relatable way is so critical because I, like, I remember the very beginning when we were really green, we would be so technical and academic and clinical and medical about all the things that we're doing and that we were like, so like highbrow about what we're creating and what it means and people were like, huh? Does it work? What is it? I don't get it. And the minute they're like, huh? They're done. You have like, you don't have a lot of time to capture someone's attention before they're like, forget it, I don't get it, it's too like, you know, out there. So accessible, relatable language. So what I learned is that rather than talking about something in those ways, to talk about it like you're, like you're texting your best friend. Like how do you, like what can you do that's so authentic and put out in the world, in the public, from an ad campaign perspective, that's like you're texting your best friend, right? And you think, and, and how do you text your best friend? It's sloppy, it's funny, it's weird, it's silly, it's real. And you can really, really taste, and like, you can, you can see real. It's not like, oh, that person's trying to be real and trying to be real with me, and I'm trying to think about what the customer wants me to say and then me be real with that. You can just tell that you're going through that versus like, what do I deeply, authentically want to share? And just share it. 
That, that's it. That is what needs to be put, it, put out in the world and that's what's gonna resonate with people and that's why I feel like for us, our, our companies, people are just like, ugh, because just, they just feel the authenticity. Like if a bird pooped on you, would you wipe it? No, you'd wash it off, simple. <laughs> Shareable and show-stopping. I mean, this next video cost us $13,000. We went up to Toronto and shot it. Um, it's a little graphic. Do I have your permission and, uh, to, to show, share it? Cons consent? Okay, great, thank you. I'm an asshole. <laughs> but like, literally, poop comes out of me. But we don't have to have this crappy relationship. We can be butt buddies forever if you stop wiping your butt and start washing with tushy. You're probably asking, what is tushy? And to that I say, you're dumb AF. Tushy is a simple, sleek, modern bidet attachment that'll wash your crusty crap cannon after you drop a few dose ickies. It'll clean your crack way better than that flimsy teepee. Why? I'm glad you asked, Dave. If you got poop anywhere else on your body, would you wipe it with paper? No, 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 no. No, you wouldn't. So why would a smart, charming, and well-adjusted catch like you wipe your pretty little fudge factory with teepee? I deserve so much better. Oh, so hard. <sighs> no, it's not. It's so simple to install that even I can do it. And I'm just a hole that expels poop. Here, I'll show you. The Tushy Bidet fits ever so perfectly in between your toilet seat and your toilet bowl. With no electricity or expensive plumbing required, Tushy uses the tap water from your wall to wash the dookie cookies from your famous anus. It's the same water you use to brush your teeth. And you know what they say, the mouth is just the asshole of the face. We provide the adapter that splits the water from your tank to your tushy for an easy, hassle-free, idiot-proof installation in under 10 minutes. I bet you could install it faster than he takes this dump. From one asshole to another. Give your back door lock the shower fresh clean it deserves. That felt so good. Every single time, I'm just like, wow, you know? Stop wiping and start washing with tushy. Trust me, I'm an asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that video has been viewed over 25 million times and returns evergreen to this day, costs us 13,000 Canadian. Okay, so you don't have to create things that cost a lot of money. You just have to have come up with creative ideas. Um, one way I'm gonna give you, I don't ever give this secret out to anybody, but I'm gonna give it to you guys because I came all this way. And it's actually true, I haven't told anyone this before. But um, the way I find my funny people to write these things is I was like, okay, where do I find funny people? I'm like, uh, Saturday Night Live. I'm like, I can't reach those people. Who are the feeders to Saturday Night Live? Upright Citizens Brigade, UCB. And so I went to UCB's website and they actually have a bunch of like their comedians like profiles and websites there. So I just went through like hundreds of people's resumes and like things and found my hilarious comedy writers. There you go, you're welcome. Um, yes, yes, it's crazy because that it, it's, un but you, you can find some raw talent that you wouldn't otherwise find. People like Mia that good. Um, so um, this campaign, this campaign is really what took things from 25,000 a month to a million dollars a month in like three short months. And w like why and how did that happen? So we, 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 in the beginning, we spent all of our time just doing digital ads, just direct response ads on Facebook, Instagram. We realized, okay, we now have amassed enough money and capital to create our first subway campaign. And the New York City public transit system, we found out, um, did not want to put our ads in the subway because we created these ads, which are beautiful and artful, and you know, really, really considered from a creative perspective. And they said, you can't use the word periods in the subway because it will be offensive to riders. And we were like, oh no, you didn't. All right, game on. And um, 
And instead of just being like, all right, we'll just change the words and say time of the month and like, you know, end of the sentence, you know, no, we're going to say period and we're going to fight them. And so we, so we, we said to them, we're like, if you do not let us say the word period in the New York City subway, the most progressive city in the world, we are going to press. And they were like, go to press. And I was like, you called my bluff. I don't know any press. God damn it. <laughs> oh, fuck. And I was like, at the time I had no contacts, but I was like, all right, okay, watch me. Okay, good. Go, okay, none. Fine. And so I like had like two contacts barely from like fourth removed, like second, like friends of like my elementary school, like high school teacher, whatever. And um, who's the same person? That was that didn't make any sense, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, and I just, and I, sent, and, and I sent them an email, subject heading, scandal with the MTA. And I wrote them this, like, this really like, impassioned email. And they both said, we want the exclusive. And I was like, I don't know anything about press. I was like, perfect, you both get the exclusive. <laughs> and they were like, that's not how press works. And they got mad at me, it was a whole thing. But finally, Mike.com, God rest his soul, published it and the story went viral internationally and I and it's like it's like those moments where you know how like if you're like if I always picture myself as like someone like busking in the subway people like throwing me pennies and you're like thanks you know and you're just like singing your heart out doing everything you can people to like get your just to like get what you're trying to put out you know and I remember the story of like when I was walking down the streets in Williamsburg Brooklyn on Bedford Avenue and I was just walking down the street to, to do one evening, and I, and I run into my friend Sham and his two cousins from India. They were, one was like in her 20s, one was like in her like 19 or so. And Sham was like, because it's a classic Indian guy, was like, oh, tell them about your idea, tell them about your project, tell them like, you know, give them a pitch. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And I was like, oh, I have a, I have a period proof underwear company called Things and whatever. And then these two women were like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I was like, I was like, and I'm Indian, I can do that, okay. Um, and I was like, what, what, what? And they both pull out their phone separately, and they were both talking about things on their WhatsApp chains with all their girlfriends. And that was my, that was like, I literally, like, I was fighting back tears. Because it was like the first time that I talked about my idea, people were like, oh, that's weird. Instead, they were like, they got it. And it was like such a moment of like, Oh, like, oh, we're on the right track. And I will never, ever, ever forget that moment for as long as I live. And every time I'm going through, like, well, anyone ever get, I'm just going to remember that moment, tap into my Dantian, and just keep moving forward. So it was a great moment. Um, <laughs> and so this, um, this, this, this ad campaign really, really put us on the map. We were going to send the MTA a like a, like a basket of grapefruit as a thank you. They were like, not funny, okay. Um, lean into the uncomfortable. I mean, just in that particular example, we could have been like, oh, well, they said no, but instead we're like, ooh, okay, we can take a, make a scandal out of this. It would be interesting. Um, in the same way, like, leaning into the uncomfortable is so important in business. Oftentimes, we, we act really safely because we don't want to piss anybody off. We don't want to get political because we shouldn't be political because what if, if, if we talk about too much lefty things and the righties will get and then we'll lose our business. So we're always trying to stay in the center and just not take a position. And when you don't, it just creates a bit of a bland thing. Like, you know, oftentimes when companies IPO or get bought out and all of a sudden, like, their spirit's gone and you're like, you can tell. You know, it's because like these big companies just want to stay in this sort of like gray area, which just loses the spirit. So, for for us, like I'm all we're always talking about how do you lean into the uncomfortable. And one of the things that happened was that while we were building the company, so many people in the trans community reached out to us and said, um, "When you transition from woman to man, you still get your period, and it's a time of weird shame, and we we feel so like outed every month, and we're always wearing like three pairs of boxers and like trying to conceal the fact that we do have the anatomy of women, but we're men." And there are 900,000 trans people in America, half of which are transitioned women to men. So it's a huge community. And so we spent the next year developing a, a, a pair of um, boy shorts specifically for the trans man in mind. And 
But not only were the trans community so overjoyed about it, this story went viral, again, internationally. And so when something that you do authentically, not knowing what's gonna happen, like we didn't know, it's not like we're doing it for viral, we just were doing it because we were like, this is the right thing to do. Like we forgot about this entire group of people, we're gonna support them, and then people wanted to write about it. It was really, really cool. So when you lean into the uncomfortable, it actually does create this friction in a story, and people do wanna read those stories. And so, and it does shift culture when they, wanna, when they read those uncomfortable stories. Another thing is, another thing that we did is that we sent an email to all of our, our um, just our customers who purchased our, our product, and we just said, just fill in the blanks. Thinks is blank, and just, just fill it in. And we got a thousand responses in 24 hours. Thinks is Mary Poppins in my pants. Thinks is strength, freedom, and dignity for all women. And we got like a thousand of them, and it created our whole campaign. Sometimes we overthink and overprocess, and I think we have to do it all on our own. But so often when we have advocates first, when we have people who love what we're doing, we just say, hey, can you just fill in the blanks? And that's it. And they can just literally create your campaign for you. And that's what we learned. And we've done it ever since for all of my companies that followed. Um, this was when Trump was elected. We created patriarchy-proof underwear. It's just funny. Uh, <laughs> why not? Yeah. <laughs> And, and we, we, we talked about radical authenticity, but I, I really know the word authenticity is like so like blah, 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 authenticity, blah, blah. But it's real. Like people forget that people want big truth. People want big radical honesty. And we just, even within ourselves, often are not in alignment. You know, I've been seeing a life coach, for, a life and leadership coach for the last six years. Uh, Mark and I actually share the same coach. And... Um, and, and what we talk about every week for 90 minutes is integrity. Integrity, what you're thinking, feeling, and saying have to align. What you're thinking, feeling, and saying have to align. What's off? Are you mumbling to yourself about something that, you, that you're not speaking up about, but you're saying to yourself? Are you saying like, oh, hey, in your head, bitch? How often do we do that, right? So often, we're just not in alignment with ourselves. We think that we're integrous people. We think that we're good people. But so often, we're not in alignment with what we're thinking, feeling, and saying. And that's what radical authenticity is is that when you just can't help but be exactly who you are because that is just, that's, you just can't help it. I said that just twice, but that's what it is. So, so you know, there's this really cool artist that I've just been looking at right lately. He has a really cool um, a talk. Uh, his name is Adam J.K. I don't know if you know who this is. He's just this creative, this zany creative, this gay Jewish guy who's just epic and awesome, wears overalls on his talks. He's just cool. And, um, and he talks about that too. Like people just want realness and 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 when you when you when you you can you can tell you can just tell when someone's real and i and i and i and i can't stress that enough like how often do we sometimes like when we're like oh my god i just like freaking verbal diarrhea and that person was so receptive to it you're like oh okay like i should that's i'm on the right path there when i'm actually saying what i'm feeling um, so that's something that when you do if you do that in the in the world of business it's the same thing as doing it to yourself because it's people that you're advertising to. Um, this is a huge one. Invite audience, customers, and press to take part in the experience. I'm a burner here. Who, anyone here go to Burning Man? Okay, I just got my tickets yesterday. I post on Insta story. I'm like, anyone tickets? And two, four people were like, I got tickets. We're like, oh my God. So I'm, here I am going, yay. Um, so, so what I love about Burning Man is that it's what you put in is what you get out. What you put in is what you get out. Part radical participation is one of the key core principles of Burning Man. And what I learned is that why people are so invested in it is because you have to bring something to the table. You have to contribute something to the playa when you go. And so you feel like you have ownership in it, right? And so when we think about press, when we think about like inviting press to our events, we never think about just like sending a press release or sending them an email or blah, 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 because when we do that, we know it never works. So what does work? What works is when we invite the audience and the press to take part in the invitation experience from the get-go. So as an example, um, during New York Fashion Week, we decided that we want to create our first fashion show with period underwear. Like, and we were going up against like the biggest companies you know, in, in like the biggest brands, the biggest labels, like the Gucci's and the blah blahs and the Prada's and the everyone's, and we were up against them. And what we learned is that um, we're gonna, if we create some weird ass invitation, maybe they'll come to our event. So I had my team go to Home Depot and buy some quick dry cement. 
and, I had, and my team had made these plexiglass invitations, black plexiglass with some like embossed writing on it that just said date, time, what to wear, and location, and that was it. And then I had them set, pour this concrete into, um, like, into these little things and create these little bricks, which, which basically covered the invitation, the plexiglass invitation. And then I had my team, like some, some of our models, deliver these invitations, these little bricks, onto um, to all the press. And then, we, and then when, they, when they went, they were, like, they were like super formal about it, so the, they like let them all in. And so then, in the silver platters and the white gloves, and they basically, so when they finally interfaced with the press, they were like, okay, we need you to smash the patriarchy, which by the way, men are also victims of just saying, um, smash the patriarchy in order to like, you know, find the invitation and, and like discover where I'm, where I'm going and what I'm doing. And so it became like a thing where they were part of the experience. They smashed this thing and they had to like clean up all the smashed things and then like carry it to the trash and then like what? It was like a thing that they had to do to even just know where to go. And literally 80 press RSVP'd in 24 hours. And we had the most epic, everybody wore white, everyone listened, we were like, we were like date, time, location, wear white, that was it. And it was like the most epic event, that was my final speech, I was like sobbing like, a, like, a, like an emotional person that we all are. Um, another thing, another, which I'm not apologetic about, I see, I did that. Um, learning, learning, learning. Um, another thing is, we, what we did was when, when we, we wanted to create an event where, a similar thing, where we had the press crack open an egg and reveal a question. And so, of course, Instagram, Instagram, Instagram moment, they all came, we had a big press dinner, and every person showed up, 100% of people showed up to our event. And so, it's just like, once you get them in with just something, with that they're, they're like, now they want to, you need to complete it. We're human beings, we like completing circles, we like completing stories, we're very good storytellers in our heads. And so when you start, and they're already now a part of the story, they want to complete it, so they're going to show up to complete the story with you. So I've learned that so many times, over and over again, and it really works. Plus, you're going to be competing against people with piles of press releases on their tables, and that's just, you're like, ha, you know, like you're just so ahead of, of them. Um, one of the things that our friend did after I, I, I talked about that was they, um, she, for a pop-up shop, she, pop, she basically sent balloons all, to all press to pop the balloon for the pop-up shop and it worked and everyone came, it was really cool. So just giving you guys some ideas. Okay, so last couple of things are, um, you know, I, 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 I spent some time writing my books, Do Cool Shit and Disruptor. Do Cool Shit really is looking at how to go from step zero to step one in building your dream business. And I think so often when we read autobiographies, I remember when I was first starting out, thinking about entrepreneurship, after I met my first entrepreneurs in New York City, thinking like, wow, this is an opportunity, this is actually a thing, people can actually start businesses. I started reading all these books, like Losing My Virginia by Richard Branson was my first book that I fell in love with, but in his book it was like, and then I raised a million dollars, and I built Virgin Records, and I did this, and I did that. And you're like, but how? What did you say in your first meeting to, get, to even get to the first meeting? How did you even raise your first $25,000? Forget your first million. I, I want to know what you said and what you did in those meetings. I want to know how you got, like, I want to know how did you even come up with the idea? Like, what was, what did you hone in on? Because we have so many ideas all the time. Like, which one did you choose? Like, how did I get my first meeting in the minds and all these people come and help ideate with me? Like, what are all those things that I did to really build my first business. And so I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna, I don't have to write a book, but I basically put down everything I learned, how I got New York Times write about us for the first time, how we got, you know, how we raised our first $250,000, like all those things to go from step zero to step one in business and life, and also which includes like how to eliminate all the negative relationships in your life to create space for the great ones, to help inspire you and push you along. And most recently, I just this year, woo, came out with my new book called Disrupt Her, which, is a manifesto for the modern woman. I talk about how it, it's, it's called a manifesto for the modern woman, but it actually is for everyone because when you think about the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, all these books, Aristotle, all these like poetry, everything that written by, by men where they write, man said this and man said that, and yet women read those texts too, right? Women read the Bible, women read Aristotle, women read all these man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl, women read those texts too. So why can't you say, a, a manifesto for the modern woman and have men read it too, we can. So this book is really meant to be read by everyone, but it says woman on there, okay? Which includes man in the woman, get it? Okay. Um, and, 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 and really, and what is it about? It's really about how to disrupt 13 major areas in your life where society tells you how you're supposed to do them. We're just 
told over and over again. This is how it is. You know, you can't talk about money. You can't talk about, you know, you, you, like, you, you know the, like you become cooler when you have more stuff. Like you actually, the more stuff you have, the more notoriety you have. You know, you have to get serious as you grow up, you know, because get your head in the clouds, sit down, be quiet, shut up. If you want to go to college, you shut up and listen. If you want to get a job, then shut up and listen. Your voice isn't a part of this equation. Like this is what we're hearing over and over again. So we're just like, okay, like this is just the way it is to, 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 to stay in my lane and just like, you know, do it that way. But that's just, that's the, there, there are so many other ways. When we think about who is society, society is people who are no different than you or me, except for 100 years ago, where now they're relevant. And so can we create our own reality for ourselves? The answer is absolutely yes. Another one that we talk about in my book is how to become a warrior gatekeeper of your mind. I'm almost done with my time, so I'm going fast. I apologize. Um, how to think of money as flowing energy. And then, you know, why women should act like bonobo apes. Um, what, what, uh, this is the last thing I'll say about this is, um, is why should women act like bonobo apes is that, you know, we forget so often that we hold the power of humanity inside our wombs and, and all men are encouraged, you know, to, 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 to be loving and, um, and so, so the, 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 let me rewind for a second. The bonobo apes, they operate as a matriarchy. Every time there's an aggressive male bonobo that tries to get with a female bonobo, all the females come together and shun that male away. And that aggressive male dies a lonely, miserable death by himself. <laughs> and so, and the female bonobos only choose to procreate with the kindest, gentlest, most loving male bonobos. And in one generation, can, can, can literally eliminate an otherwise aggressive society and create a kind, gentle, loving one. So as women, can we not do that too? Yes, we can. So this is it. The world needs people who are ready to disrupt. Are you with me? Can we disrupt together? Thank you so much. So yeah. very...